Okay, let's uh, turn in our Bibles tonight to Exodus chapter 38, and uh, the goal is to finish the book of Exodus. And it's it's a lot of reading. Some of it's redundant from what we've been through before in the you know the design of the tabernacle, and now it's in the making of the parts and the the priests' garments and all of that. But uh, you know you can roughly break um, Israel, or I'm sorry, Exodus into three groups. Three major divisions, and uh, it would be the first 15 chapters have to do with Israel in Egypt and then through the Red Sea, and and from the Red Sea to to Sin- Mount Sinai in 16 through 18, and then from 19, chapter 19 all the way to 40, it has to do with Israel at Mount Sinai. And this whole Exodus period, uh, the the book of Exodus, 40 chapters, it covers uh, 216 years. Okay, so. It was a while. Now let's begin in chapter 8, more construction of the tabernacle. Let me see here. Uh, Okay. And he made the altar of burnt offering of shittim wood. Five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof. It was four square. And three cubits the height thereof, and he made the horns thereof of On the four corners of it, the horns thereof were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots and the shovels and the basins and the flesh hooks and the fire pans and all the vessels therein he made of brass. And uh, later on, I'll go through the weights of the gold and the silver and the brass. But the the brass itself was 144,000 pounds or 72 tons of just brass in here. Oh, think about it. It's, it's a lot of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network of, under the compass thereof, beneath unto the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass, gra- brass to be places for the staves. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar to bear it withal. He made the altar hollow with boards, and he made the laver of brass, and the foot of it of brass, and the looking glasses, mirrors, this is the looking glasses of the women assembling, were assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So uh, if you look at your your picture of the tab, of the uh, tabernacle there that we handed out, that we have, I think I have one, there we go, yeah, he's... Uh, you can see that the at the back, that uh, uh, little tent-covered place at the back, that's the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. So the outer court is everything outward from that. So uh, the outer court, all the uh, posts that held things up, like the curtains and the in- implements, those are all made of wood, but they're covered with brass. And he says the... Uh, the The altar there was uh, seven and a half feet by square by four and a half feet high. It's kind of like a gigantic barbecue pit. And it was there for burning the sacrificed animals. And uh, in in reference to the looking glasses in verse 8, the looking glasses, in Egypt, uh, they, they were very much into makeup and eye makeup on the men and the women. So there was a lot of makeup, and you don't put makeup on unless you have some way to look at yourself to do it, or you're going to have the stuff all over your face, and that's not an improvement. So they had these highly, highly polished pieces of brass to use as mirrors. And just an interesting sidelight, the, uh, <clears throat> the root word for cosmetics comes from the word cosmos, which really means to bring order out of chaos. Uh, I'm not going to attempt any application here, but uh, that's what makeup is called, is bringing... Uh, uh, order out of chaos, but you can think about it. The, the commitment. There's enough of these that there there are enough of them to be melted down to be part of the uh, the altar. So they're bringing their their mirrors, and this isn't something they could replace easily. I mean, they're you know think about it, highly polished brass, and they would be used for the labor that is being used now for the brass or of brass, I should say. <clears throat> Pardon me. Verse nine through eighteen, and he made the court. On the south side, southward, the hangings of the court were of tw- fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. <coughs> uh, their pillars were twenty, and their uh, brazen sockets twenty, and the hooks of the pillars and their fillets 
were of silver. And for the north side of the hangings were a hundred cubits. Uh, their pillars were twenty, and their sockets of brass twenty, and the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And the west side were hang for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits, then pillars ten, and their sockets uh, ten, and the hooks uh, of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And the east side, eastward, fifty cubits, uh, the size, the seventy-five feet, side to side. The hangings of the one side of the gate were 15 cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And if you look at the picture, you can see in the front there where the, the front is where the, it looks colored fence there in the front. All the hangings of the court round about were of fine twined linen. And the sockets for the pillars were of brass, and hook, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver and the overlaying of their chapters of silver and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the hanging of the gate of the court was network or needlework of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And 20 cubits was the length. And the height of the breadth was five cubits, answerable to the hangings of the court. So here's this, the, 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 uh, the uh, court and the pillars and all these linen cloths they're talking about. In the construction of the, the uh, tabernacle itself, it's 150 feet long, 75 feet uh, across. And uh, these posts, they're uh, in silver sockets that hold the curtains up and uh, they're hooks. And, and the linen fence, uh, it went all along the sides. You, that's what the sides are. And if you're down in the ground looking at them, you wouldn't be able to see in. But the uh, the uh, linen fence is supported on pillars that are seven feet tall. Okay, so verse 21. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony, as it was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites, uh, for the or by the hand of Ithamar and son to Aaron the priest. And Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the son, uh, tribe of Judah, made all that uh, the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, or Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a cunning workman, an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet and fine linen. And all the gold that was occupied for the work and all the work of the holy place, even the gold of the offering, was twenty and nine talents and seven hundred and thirty shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. The bika of for every man, that is half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that went up to be numbered from 20 years old upward for 600,000 and 300 and 550 men. And of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil and hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. And of the thousand seven hundred seventy and five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their chapters and filleted them. And the brass of the offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. And then the next two verses. And therewith he made the sockets to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the brazen altar and the brazen grate for it and the vessels of the altar and the sockets of the court round about and the sockets of the court gate and all the pins of the tabernacle and all the pins of the court round about. So he's summing up the tabernacle here and he's giving a, an inventory of the, of the materials that are needed. And he, he's, it's interesting because uh, he's looking for Offerings, uh, the half a shekel is to count them in a census, okay? So that was the half a shekel count. And then there's the other offering just to give of their stuff, their gold and their silver and their brass, so that they could be melted down to construct the tabernacle, okay? That's where we are here. So now in chapter 39, it's going to go back through uh, some of the, uh, the making of the priestly garments here, and mostly reading. Uh, first, it's the ephod. That's the, the breastplate. And of the blue and purple and scarlet, they made cloths of silver to do service in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. 
And he made the ephod of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And they did beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue. So they made thread out of it and just threaded it through the, the, the blue and in the purple and in the scarlet and the fine linen with cunning work, he says. And they made shoulder pieces for it, of course, to hold it on, to couple it together. By the two edges was it coupled together. And the curious girdle of his ephod, that was upon it, was of the same, uh, according to the work thereof, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they wrought onyx stones enclosed in ouches, uh, or clasps of gold, graven as signets are graven with the names of the children of Israel. And he put them on the shoulders of the ephod, that they should be stones for a memorial to the children of Esau, or, I'm sorry, Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. <clears throat> and he made the breastplate of cunning work, like the work of the ephod, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. It was four square. They made the breastplate double. A span was the length thereof, and a span the breadth thereof being doubled. And they set it in four rows of stones. The first row was a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. In the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. In the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in ouches, their clasps of gold, in their enclosings. And the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name, according to the twelve tribes. And they made upon the breastplate, breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold, and they made two ouches of gold and two rings and put the two rings in the two ends of the breastplate. And they put the two wreathing chains of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate. And the two ends of the two wreathing chains they fastened in the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate upon the shoulder of it, which was on the side of the ephod inward. And they made two other golden rings and put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath toward the forepart of it over against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. You have to look at the picture of the, the priest to see these things. And they did bind the breastplate by his rings into, under the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue that it might be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate might be, not be loosed from the ephod, as the Lord commanded Moses. So he has this breastplate on there, 12 sockets, you know, the, and there's a, a, a stone to represent each tribe in the, uh, in the breastplate. And uh, the, uh, the idea was that the high priest was carrying the nation of God on his heart. That's the idea of his because uh, God was bearing Israel on his heart in that sense, because uh, he was taking care of them. And we're, we're made in his image, and he wants to, us to have his heart also, a heart of love and compassion, a broken heart for, for sinners and their need for God. Because it's one of the things that we see is that everybody's a sinner. We all need to know who God is and that he came and died for our sins on the cross. Uh, next, the, the robe, verses 22 through 31. And he made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue. And there was a hole in the midst of the robe as the hole of a habergeon with a band around the hole that it should not rend or tear. And they made upon the hems of the robe pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet and twined linen. And they made bells of pure gold, and, and put the bells between the pomegranates upon the hem of the robe, round about between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, round about the hem of the robe to minister in, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made coats of fine linen of woven, woven work for Aaron and for his sons, and a mitre of fine linen, and goodly bonnets, of fine linen, in linen breeches of fine uh, twined linen, in a girdle of fine twined linen, in blue and purple and scarlet of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, 
and wrote upon it a writing like to the engravings of a signet, Holiness to the Lord. And they tied unto it a lace of blue to fasten it on high upon the mitre as the Lord commanded Moses. So he's talking about making of the priestly garments here and the ephod, the breastplate, and uh, all, all the other clothing that the priest uh, would be wearing. And then finally here, verse 32, um, as now they've, they've, they've placed before the people the need that they have. And now we're going to see the, the people uh, bringing the work back to Moses now in verse 32. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished. This took some time. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses, the tent and all his furniture, his tashes, his boards, his bars, and his pillars and his sockets. And the covering of ram skins dyed red, and the covering of badger skins, and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony, and the staves thereof, and the mercy seat, the table, and all the vessels thereof, and the showbread, the purple candlestick with the lamps thereof, even with the lamps to be set in order, and all the vessels thereof, and the oil for the light, and the golden altar, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the tabernacle door, the brazen altar, and his grate of brass, his staves and all his vessels, the laver and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and his sockets, and the hanging for the court gate, his cords and his pins, and all the vessels of the service of the tabern tabernacle for the tent of the congregation, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and his son's garments to minister in the priest's office." according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So the children of Israel made all the work. Very fine, detailed work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. So it's estimated they took them about six months to put together all the parts of the tabernacle, all the hooks and the sockets and the wood and the curtains and all of that. All the parts are made one at a time, and now it's completed. So we're, we're entering now into the last chapter, and there's some more things to look at in this chapter as they set up the tabernacle. And I, you know, there are places around where you can go and walk through one of these tabernacles. They have them set up, but there's one in PA, and I don't remember where else, but there are some around. Do you remember? Florida? Oh, yeah, is that what it was, Florida? All right. So... Chapter 40. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and the light, and light the lamps thereof, the menorah, in other words. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the, of the testimony, and uh, put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shall put water therein. Thou shalt set up the court round about and hang up the hanging at the court gate. Now, let's, if you look at this uh, little thing I handed out, up in the right-hand corner there's a, a little black and white, well, a rectangular drawing that shows where things are. So you can see on the left-hand side of that little inset there, there's the entrance, and you can see that down in the picture. It's the pinkish-looking curtains. And then you, you go right to the altar the, the burnt, uh, of burnt offering, and then you can see it in the picture also. And then a little further toward the, toward the holy place, there's what's called the laver, where they would wash it. And then you enter into the holy place. And out, you know, the table of showbread on one side, the lampstand, the menorah on the other, the incense 
uh, altar, and then inside that, the Holy of Holies. Okay, so they, they're setting it all up now, the whole structure of the tabernacle. They have the outer court. They have the holy place inside, and they've got getting all the things in. They're, they're placing all the furniture, everything, and it's given in great detail. I really need to get down to see one of those full setups in the priest's gowns and you know, garb and everything. Uh, verse 9 through 16. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein, and shalt hallow it and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels, and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. And thou shalt anoint the laver and his foot, and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. And thou shalt put a, uh, upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt bring his sons, and clothe them with co coats. And thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. So uh, Moses did what God told him, and we as Christians uh, should be wanting to do what the God tells us to do. But we don't always want to do what God tells us to do. Uh, it's interesting. James had a verse in the book of James 4.17. It says, Therefore, him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. doesn't mean it's sin when we don't know what we're doing. I mean, there is the um, sins and trespasses. But when God shows us and we know we should, shouldn't do it and, or should do it and don't do it, that's sin. And... Uh, we, as Christian men, we certainly know that we're, in Ephesians 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We know that. We study it. We read it. Yet we do fall short of doing it. And uh, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. We know that, too. Yet we sometimes fall short of it. Uh, the good thing we Christian men have that the rest of the world doesn't have is the natural man don't have is God's Holy Spirit, God's high calling, that God's calling into righteousness, his high goal that he set. We have the knowledge of God's word. We have it in our hands. We can read it. We have the presence of God's Holy Spirit. And he says this consecration here by anointing. In other words, consecration means a dedication to, a setting apart to something, to the worship and to the service of God. And it's signified, interestingly, with oil, olive oil in this case, but anointing oil. And oil in Scripture often represents God's Holy Spirit, meaning that we need the Holy Spirit anointing to do the things of God. And it is true. Without him, we can do nothing. Verse 17. Now we're going to take a look at the, a picture of the, uh, looking at the tabernacle. As it came to pass, or and it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof. And I think he had a few helpers and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. So he puts together all the setting of the boards and covers it with all the curtains now. And then uh, verse uh, twenty. He took and put the testimony into the ark, and he set the staves on the ark. He put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. So he's he has the ark of the covenant now, and if you look at that little inset, you see a, a way it the little thing up here. You see over on the left it says ark. <laughs> That's the Ark of the Covenant, and that is the Holy of Holies. The whole thing's called the Holy Place, uh, that that little tent, that tent inside the, the tabernacle. So and in the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. In verse 22, and he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. 
And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So the table of showbread put inside the holy place on the right side. And it shows it there in that little inset, the table of showbread. In verse 24, and he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. The lampstand, the menorah, put in place on the left side. It's the only source of light in the Holy of Holies. Verse 25, and he lighted the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. So the golden altar of incense is now put in place. Verse 28, and he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle. So the, the screens put up in the front uh, um, of closing off the most holy place from the holy place. In verse 29, and he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered it offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. So the the brazen altar now, that has been put in place. Verse 30, And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put the water there to wash withal. So the laver, laver between the altar and the tent, you can see it in the picture. It's that last little thing looks like a big old basin with a base on it. Between the altar and the tent. And it's a huge wash basin for the priests to wash the meat, the animals in. Verse 31, And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. So the, the outer court now has been set up, and uh, he's saying that this ground that's here now is no longer just ground. This is holy ground. This is ground that's been set apart to God. This is a ground that's sanctified to God. This is where, where God is going to meet with Israel. He's going to meet with the high priest. It's a special place, not just plain ground. The Verse 34 and when the cloud, or then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we see the glory of God's presence here in the tabernacle. It's the, it's the first time that God literally says he's dwelling in the midst of his people. It's an important time in Israel's history. It's an important time in mankind's history. It's interesting because I said I would address the, uh, the, the amount of the metals, at least, involved here. To build the tabernacles, just say, at today's prices. When you add all this up, it comes to about 2,700 pounds of gold. 2,700 pounds of gold. Gold is now selling for about $1,900 an ounce. So you multiply 1,900 times 16, you get the amount per pound, and you multiply that 2,700, and you come out with about about 82 million. About 82 million, okay? Four and a half tons of silver. Silver is going for about 25 an ounce now. That comes up to about two and a half million, 2.4 actually. Three tons of bronze, at dollar, that's only a dollar and a half an ounce, but that's still $144,000. So a total of $85 million for six tons of metal materials here. Now, as people, the commentators over the years, have estimated the amount of the weight, they, there's been quite a bit of variation. They actually vary all the way from six tons for the tabernacle to 12 tons. So the price of it in today's market is somewhere between 85 and $170 million at today's prices. It makes it, in my estimation anyway, the most expensive tent on the face of the earth. Okay. <laughs> now here's some good news. It's in your notes, the notes of the verses. Uh, Ephesians 2.14. He is our peace, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You see, here in the, in the tabernacle, there's a, there's a curtain to keep people out of the tabernacle. There's a curtain but at the end of the holy place, and you've got to go through it. Only the high priest can. Then from there to go into the holy of holies, there's another curtain there, a wall of partition. 
So what he's saying is Ephesians 2.14, For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He's talking about that wall that's there in the Old Testament in the Holy of Holies, in the holy place. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. This is, you know, back to Exodus. They had all kinds of ordinances and laws. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, yeah, well, we were all far off from God at some point in our lives. And to them that were near or nigh, King James says. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more spirit strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly to, or frame, fitly framed together grows unto a temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So God also has now a new temple for worship. It's in the notes here. First Corinthians six nineteen. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of God? You could call it the tabernacle, I guess, since we're dealing with the Old Testament. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. So since God's Holy Ghost is in us, then we're a holy place, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's saying, hey, open your eyes. God revealed himself to you. He gave you his word. He, he gave you faith to believe. You believed. Now the Holy Spirit dwells there, and your body's now a holy place. We don't come here to meet God. We bring him in in the form of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands, but he dwells in the fleshy tables of our hearts. Verse 36. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the, this is getting exciting now, the stuff's happening. The children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the houses of Israel throughout all their journeys. Cloud moved, they moved. Cloud stood still, they still stood still. The cloud gave shade during the day. They are in the desert after all. They have this pillar of fire to give them light at night. Go out to the bathroom. I don't know where it is. Well, there's light. You know, just turn the light on. No, no, the light is on. So it says here that as God's glory fills the tabernacle. What a happy ending here. The tabernacle being the throne room of God. But look at all the things they had to go through. Well, think about this. When this cloud starts to move, it's time to tear down that 6 to 12 tons of materials and pack it up in wagons and move on again. That took a little time. That took a few hands, a lot of hands. Um, the, the camp of Israel at that time is estimated to be somewhere between 2 and 3 million people. Now, I tried to find out how big a, a camp that is. I mean, if all of us went out and camped out, you know, we could number the number of tents and it wouldn't be that big. But think about this. Two to three million people in tents plus six to 12 uh, tons of stuff. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> the tabernacle. <laughs> uh, so there, there's, there's two to three million Jews in tents spread out all as far as you could see, I'm sure. I don't know how many square miles it was, but it must have covered a really big area. Um, so God gave Israel a tabernacle so they could meet him there. God gave us a tabernacle where his Holy Spirit can live. Second Corinthians 5, 1 in your notes. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he's talking about this, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's saying, you know, don't worry about that tabernacle that you got that you call a body. That's temporary. We're three-part beings, um, body, soul, and spirit. The body, we know, is it's getting older, isn't it? It's getting <laughs> closer to the end here on this earth than it was uh, to the, at the beginning. But we, this earthly house, it, it, it's, when it's dissolved, he says, we have a building for God 
eternal in the heavens, a house not made with hands. In other words, that's our, our body we're going to go to be in. Hebrews 9.11, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not just a high priest in this one in the wilderness, but a better one, a more perfect one, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. The Schofield Reference Bible says that uh, what the Shekinah glory was to the tabernacle in the temple, the spirit is to the holy temple of the church, us uh, uh, believers, and to the temple, which is the believer's body. Our body is the temple. So we're not to desecrate the temple. As uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? Jesus said in Matthew 5.14 that we're, we're the light of the world. You know, this, this tabernacle that holds the light of God, that holds the spirit of God, uh, should be out lighting the world. For believers in Jesus Christ, we're the light of the world. We're called the salt of the earth. Salty and lighty, I guess. But God, he's not looking to form a new religion. God is not interested in religion. He's interested in relationship. He wants a relationship with us. Why when people say, I don't know how to pray, talk. You know how to talk? Talk to God. You're talking to me now. Talk to God. Um, but, uh, you know, on a human level, we can look around and say, well, they're a good person. They're not a very good person over there. They're a good person. They aren't. You know, some people are better than others, even in the world. But from God's perspective, compared to Jesus, I guess how high and mighty we are. We all fall short of God's perfection. We know that. You know what that's called? It's called sin. And uh, I have in the notes here, Luke 18, verse 10, two men went up into a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. That, well, this is another way. I'm not as bad as those other men are. He says, I'm glad, I'm, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican, this IRS guy, this tax collector, I, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He says, I tell you, Jesus said, this man, this tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. That pompous religious guy. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The principle of God's kingdom is when we come to God, we realize who he is. We realize who we are. We realize what he's done. <laughs> and we realize what we deserve. We deserve hell. I mean, literally, we do. The Bible says so. Because one sin gets us into hell, but Christ died for us, so we don't have to pay that price. That's when we can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But it's interesting in Luke 18, notice that uh, that Pharisee, uh, they call him the moral guy. He's the moralist in, in Luke 18. He isn't conge- condemned for judging others. He's condemned because he's guilty of the same thing he's condemning others of. He's just as sinful as they are, and he thinks he's like, oh, I'm glad I'm not like them. (laughs) The point is that the moral person is just as guilty as the obvious sinner, because we all fall short of the glory of God. So how can anybody escape the judgment of God then? There are no exceptions. We're all lost. We're all separated from God. Nobody can get to him in his own strength and good deeds or good works. Worldly millionaires are lost too, empty without Christ. We all fall short and we all need a savior. We know that. I, uh, I ran across an article that talked about uh, just some of the strange things we Americans do. And uh, this is certainly true that the government, uh, we yell for the government to balance the budget. Some will yell for the government to balance the budget then take the last dime they have uh, to make a down payment on a car that will take five years to pay off. Uh, some will tie up their dog and let their children run f- wild. <laughs> some will work hard on a farm so we can move into town where we can make more money so we can move back to the farm. <laughs> uh, we get upset when we're spending billions for education, but then turn around and spend billions on alcohol and drugs. 
This, this is interesting. We're supposed to be the most civilized Christian place on earth, but we still can't deliver payrolls without an armored car. It's true. We have more marriage counselors and experts than any other country in the world, and we have more divorces. Sad commentary. We're in a country that has more food to eat than any other country in the world and more diets to keep us from eating it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting how we are? But this is all about what is this tabernacle to us? What is, who is Christ to us? Who is Christ to me? Who is Christ to you? And as we look at the construction of the tabernacle and the furniture, we should be reminded of Jesus. There are some things here in the outer court. That brazen altar of sacrifice reminds us of Jesus who sacrificed himself for us so that we might live. He took sin upon himself so that we don't have to pay the price. In the outer court, there's that brazen laver where the priests washed. They needed to be cleansed, reminding us of Jesus, who is the word of God who washed us from sin, and who continues to wash us daily by reading his word. It says we're washed in the water of the word, in the holy place, in the inner court, that table of showbread. Bread. Remember, Jesus, he's called the bread of life. He came from Bethlehem, uh, the house of bread. Uh, and we need to have fellowship uh, with him in prayer and his word. With the golden lampstand, the menorah, remind us truly of Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's come to shine his light in our hearts so we can shine back out and keep this going till the Lord returns. Altar of incense, reminding us of Jesus, our intercessor. And, and he's, he's sitting at the right hand of God now, praying for us, interceding for us. And it's a reminder that our prayers have a sweet smell to God and they're continually rising to heaven. It reminded that we should be praying without ceasing as much as possible. The anointing oil of the priest represents God's Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit anointed so much needed to see and to understand the things of God, to take us into the deeper things of God. And finally, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat, reminding us of Jesus' death on the cross. God's greatest act of mercy. We need mercy. Grace is not getting what we or grace is getting what we don't deserve, which is salvation and forgiveness. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And his greatest act of mercy is expressed in John 3.16. We all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And there's nothing more that we can say than that verse. That's the, that's the best word, verse to, that, that has it all. Yeah. Let's close in prayer. Lord, uh, we do thank you for, oh, Lord, the illustrations. There are so many more that I didn't even touch upon, Lord, that uh, show Jesus in the tabernacle. And all those requirements of what it took to come to, into your presence, Lord, they're gone. We can come any time. We can go boldly to th the throne of grace. You're never busy. You always have time for us. And you've given us your word that we might know you more. We might keep reading it and learn of you more and more, Lord, as we go deeper into the word of God and the deeper it gets, the deeper we grow and the more we grow. Thank you, Lord, that we look forward to that day of your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen.